Okay, let's start. Um, thank you for coming, everybody. Uh, I don't think I'd be surprising anybody if I said this is a larger audience than I was expecting. This is good. Clearly, there is a real appetite for talking about debugging, or at least listening to me talk about it. Uh, we we don't really talk about debugging much. I mean, if you look at the sessions that we've got around at Fosdem this year, you'll see all people talking about all these cool things that they've invented. But everybody in this room who does this for a living or who wants to do this for a living knows that debugging is a really large part of how we spend our time. It's one of the crucial skills that every working programmer must have. And I don't know that any, it's been a long time since I've been in any kind of college, but I don't know that anybody in any college seriously does this as a course. It's just one of these apprenticeship things, so that once you've qualified as a computer scientist or computer engineer or whatever you are, you then go into industry and then you talk about debugging. And then you learn it from a, ma a master crafts person. Um, and you learn how it really gets done. This is interesting. We should talk about debugging a lot. So this talk is about a particularly difficult bug. I've been in the industry working professionally as a, as a programmer for 30 years now, and this is the most difficult bug that I ever managed to fix. Um, in fixing it, I had to use every debugging tool that I know of. Um, so it's a useful tour of the sort of debugging tools that you've got, the debugging tools that are part of OpenJDK and so on. So, this bug report dropped into my inbox one day in October. Intermittent said we running parallel GC. So we're seeing safe faults, you know, memory access violations, running spec JDB 2013, which is no longer available, I have to point out. So it's a great piece of software that you can load and forget. It's not enough to just have a um, It only occurred on PartnerX hardware. Um, it was secret at the time who it was. I can tell you now it was Cavium, and I can tell you that because I'm going to skip forward and tell you it wasn't their fault. There was nothing wrong with their hardware. It was just that we'd only ever actually seen the button on their hardware. So it only occurs with the parallel garbage collector. Hotspot has several garbage collectors built in. Is it five? I can't remember. And, and, yeah, probably five. And the, the bug that we've seen was only with the parallel garbage collector. The frequency of the crash is about one in two runs. Okay. Now I'll tell you now it can take an hour to run Spec J in V2013. Um, so maybe if you were lucky, you ran the program several times, you would get it to fail once a day. Um, this is the command to run it, which is basically telling you that you want to run a 50 gigabyte heap um, <coughs> with a lot of um, fork join workers, so a lot of parallel threads. So this is a bug that only exhibits itself on a really big machine with a lot of processors. So the question came up on Quora long ago. What is the worst ever bug? And Brian Schmitz, who I think might be at Microsoft answer. Okay, so this is the bug. It only occurs in connections that can replicate their triggered locally. Probability of the bug is low, not low enough to be all. Cause of the bug involves a range condition that only occurs on the load. The cause of the bug is unknown. I didn't write the code that caused the bug, but I was responsible for fixing it. The person who the code no longer works for the company. The issue that caused the bug is some library that's reliable 99.9% .9 of the time. In this case, 99.99999% of the time. And this is the last place you would look. Many others have attempted to debug it, nobody succeeded. It's a logical error that only occurs after a long time. It requires expertise in a field you know nothing about. You have a tight deadline to fix the bug. The bug can't be ignored because your job is at stake. <laughs> now, <laughs> let's have a look at this particular bug. 
Okay, now, not quite true, we could replicate it. Uh, the person who wrote the book code no longer works for the company? I don't know. This is somewhere in Hotspot. Hotspot is a million lines of code. Actually a million, that's not a figure of speech. It actually is a million <coughs> lines of code. Um, nobody else had ever tried to fix it before. Oh, but the others, some live it's reliable, you didn't write the code, I don't know, I don't know. somewhere in Hotspot. Uh, debugging requires expertise in a field you know nothing about. Okay, now, I'm possibly going a bit far out of limb here, but I think it's possible to say that nobody alive actually understands all the thoughts about it. Um, unless that's John Rose if that's true, but I think it probably is. Um, well, John, John. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, nobody was going to fire me if I couldn't find this bug, but I've been working on this ARC 64 port of OpenJDK for, I don't know, two, two and a half years, I mean, three years, is it? I can't remember. Um, and basically, unless I found and fixed this bug, we were going to have to abandon the project. Okay? There's no way that we could possibly go into production uh, with this bug. And I'm going to add another one that Brian Schmidt didn't think of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is a new chip, right? I'm a very, very lucky person. The machine on my desk is cut from the very first Wi-Fi of these chips. It is the pre-production sample that's going into testing. And hitherto, up until this time, on the other ARC64 chips that we had received, I had always managed to find new bugs in the hardware that the manufacturer didn't know about. So, all the time, this is nagging at the back of my head. Is there something wrong with this ship that causes it to make an incorrect access on every few billion? Actually, it's more than trillion, given that it's running at um, probably the best part of certainly hundreds of MIPS, and it's taking a day or so to. So, you're talking about the fault of more than a trillion. Uh, yeah, Dave Dice um, at some later oracle has actually said that Java will find hardware bugs that pass very severe tests and don't affect the eyes coming. So you can have a hardware which seems to be running Linux and you run Java on it and it will crash and it, because of the bugs in the hardware. So I was simply not prepared to believe that the hardware was reliable. And this is a really, really, really bad state of mind to be in when you're debugging. Um, if you're searching for a bug, you've really got to believe it's a bug in the case of software. Even if you think, well, you know, because otherwise it's going to be hard to motivate yourself. You'll just say, oh, okay, the computer's broken. Um, which, you know, usually for most people here, you will be working on computers that have already been properly designed and built and all the rest of it. But I'm not. I mean, this is really new stuff. So, I tried to forget that the hardware wasn't reliable. I'm trying to do some kind of auto-hypnosis thing. Stop thinking that. Stop thinking that. Stop thinking that. Look for the bug in the software. But it's always in the back of your mind when you go to sleep at night. You've just spent the last week looking at this thing. And it's probably broken computer. So it is. So here we go. This is what debugging actually is. First, you have to introduce the problem. You have to gather clues, look at the data. You come up with a hypothesis. You try to prove that hypothesis wrong. If you succeed in proving yourself wrong, you go back. You iterate until you can no longer prove your guess wrong. Now. This is perhaps slightly non obvious, this three thing here. The people who are not so experienced and perhaps not so good at debugging often try to prove their own guesses right. Um, anybody who's read Karl Popper uh, knows that the process of the scientific method is not really about proving your pet theory correct, it's about trying to disprove it. And if you fail to disprove it, then you know, maybe you're right, maybe you're not, but that's the best that you ever do. So, you make a guess, you try to prove your own guess wrong, and you use the very best intellectual apparatus that you have to prove yourself wrong. 
this has to be a kind of, not exactly egoless process, but you have to be prepared to be disappointed in yourself. You expect that. And you go through it and you write a patch and you test it and you know, the, rest, the rest is kind of obvious. So, you really want to get in there, attach a debugger and see if you can see what's going wrong. But you can't just sit at the console repeatedly running the program. You write a little GDB script. There you go. So, what this does, you want to run the program inside GDB. And you add a couple of breakpoints. One at the VM error reporting. So if, if the virtual machine ever crashes, it always calls this report VM error uh, routine. So that you can intercept any sort of a VM fault. And you put a breakpoint on underbar exit. I don't know how many of you people here know what underbar exit is, but the C runtime always calls underbar exit just before exiting. So you can put a breakpoint on that, and you can set a little action on that, which we won't do. So GDB just sits in a loop, running it again and again. So? Did it happen in the debug mode or in the product? Uh, it took so long to run that I still don't know. It would have been so much slower to reproduce the bug in the debug version that I never even tried. So it just sits there for hours, running away to itself, while I was trying to think about something else to do, maybe go for a walk, have a cup of tea. Um, while this is going on, it's quite difficult to focus on some sort of other task, or at least it is for me. Anyway, hours pass, and finally, kabang, it's hit there, inside the bugger. Whoa. But, note, we have all of our variables <laughs> that we might actually want to tell us what's gone wrong where have been helpfully removed by GCC. This is an optimized build of the hotspot virtual machine and blah, 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 blah. However, there is a way around this, and this is make a change to the hotspot make files so that we're no longer building with O3, which is the highest level of optimization that GCC does. We're doing it with OG, that's a lowercase g there. OG is magic. What GDB actually does, it does lots and lots of optimization, but you've still got a hope in hell of debugging it. It's not perfect, but it means optimize with proper debugging information. A lot of people don't know that's there. It is fantastically useful. So, run it again, hours pass, kablooey, whoa! We haven't quite got everything, but we've got something. And we can now see, at least we've got some idea about what objects the, uh, the code is actually looking at. And note that it's actually crashed this time in native code. I ran this several times, and sometimes it would crash in native code, sometimes it would crash in compiler-generated code, sometimes it would crash in the interpreter. Um, all that we actually know, then, is that there is a bad pointer somewhere from somewhere. Um, OK, the first thing to do, generate core file in GDB, and that takes the process image, saves it on disk, so you can come and have a look at it later. Even just doing this takes 10 minutes. That's 10 minutes of solid time writing to the disk. A 50 gigabyte heap is huge. Most of the tools that you've got are going to take one look at 50 gigabytes. And it's going to... <laughs> <laughs> so I was able to do this a few times and gather some data each time looking for some kind of commonality. At this point, you're just trying to use intuition. You look at the addresses. Is the address obviously complete nonsense? If it's just FFF dead or something, then that tells you something. If it's a pointer that looks reasonable, that tells you something else. Um, so this is what I've got. And this is a fairly typical one. And so we're examining the object in memory. 
Those of you who know Java will see straight away. This is a valid hotspot lock word. Um, this is uh, <coughs> normally in hotspot, unless an object is actually locked, you'll see something that looks like this. And it's followed by some pointers, which all look perfectly reasonable. There's nothing obviously wrong with that. So why did we get a safe fault? Well, what I actually did next was have a look at the assembly code uh, at the point where it said fault to try and understand what it was looking at. Um, it, it was not clear. Um, there was, there we were getting a bad point to someone. Okay, so I spent a day or two looking through the memory. Because by, by this time, I had actually managed to capture several images. Um, so simply telling you, telling you that tells you that I was already quite a few days in. So I got memory images and I could see where the bad pointer was. But it was kind of becoming clear that by the time the said fault happens, the evidence that you need has gone. Um, <coughs> somehow you're always going to wind back time. But because this is a machine with a huge number of cores and big memory, there's no way you can possibly save all of this stuff. Um, so it, it's said fault to me different times. Usually, you know, for most bugs that I see, I would have fixed it. Right? And this whole situation, I mean, was was something that I was actually fairly unfamiliar with. I'd normally be able to get some clue by now. So, HSDB to the rescue. HSDB, okay, anybody here know what hotspot debugger is, has ever used it? You must do. No? No? Right, okay, HSDB, it's the hotspot debugger. It's a GUI tool that allows you to inspect either a running hotspot or core file or you run it. Yeah, this is this is how you run it. It's part of OpenJDK, uh, and it, it gives you a really multi-windowed interface, which allows you to do things like look at stack traces, inspect objects, inspect classes. Uh, the resolution is too bad for you to see it, but you get the idea. I mean, any entity that is at all interesting in the hotspot virtual machine, you can look at it and click it and follow it and see where things go. You can see whether an object is alive or dead. You can see whether a, a pointer is valid or not. <laughs> this is actually the object that I was just showing you in GDB. It's too small for you to see here. So here's one I prepared before. There's a zoom in on that. I don't know how many of you can see it, but here we go. So somewhere in this object, we've got an object pointer which Hotspot Debugger says is a bad oop. And what bad oop actually means is this pointer does not point to an object, which is, you know, sort of a universal rule in Java. Um, pointers always point to objects. So, um, even what is interesting, though, is that this bad oop, even though it's bad, it doesn't point to a valid object, it does point into the heap. It does point to, into a valid region of memory. So it's not a wild pointer pointing off into nowhere land. It's pointing into the heap, but it's not pointing at the start of our object. OK, so <laughs> this is ARM64, AR64. It uses relaxed memory consistency. Uh, Every core has its own caches, they are quite loosely coupled. They are only synchronized by explicit memory barrier instructions. Now, if you only use the typical Intel x86 processors and so on, you might not be all that familiar with this. But literally, I have seen on some of these systems, you can write to a region of memory, and a long, 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 long time can pass before other cores actually get to see it. By a long time, I mean, long human time. I'm not talking milliseconds here. It can be a very long time. Basically, unless the core gets preempted for whatever reason, um, 
that memory is not going to be made visible unless you have some sort of memory barrier instruction. So, here's my guess, right? Maybe some memory barriers are missing somewhere. Um, this is somewhat complicated by the fact that Hotspot has a lot of what we call stub code. Now, Hotspot is all coded around the idea of fast paths. So, whenever there's something that's executed frequently, you tend to split it up into fast path and slow path. Uh, the fast path would be the, the, the typical uh, thing where you're allocating memory or something like that. The slow path code would be when, say, you run out of memory. Um, so it's executed very, very rarely. So it is perfectly possible, and indeed this happened with the ARC64 port, that you've got some slow path code, which is only there for really unusual corner cases, and it can be wrong. And the virtual machine can pass all its tests, and it could have been wrong for years. It, all, of, all of this is possible. So whenever you see something very, very rare happening like this, you start thinking, okay, slow path code. So I spent some time looking at the just-in-time compilers and the interpreter, sprinkling memory barriers all over the place, even though I didn't think they were necessary, just in case. And of course, you know, if there had been some sort of hardware fault, then sprinkling barriers all over the place might have actually fixed it, or at least make the problem move or something like that, but no luck. Um, bear in mind that, you know, this is still uh, taking half a day, maybe a whole day to reproduce the problem. So, oh, I was pretty much stuck for now. Okay, people, what would you do? Sorry? Yeah. Mm. Uh, but I, somehow, whatever the guess is, I've got to find a way to prove it. So, uh, I'm uh, not familiar with OpenZDK. Could you log if that pointer had ever been a valid pointer? Like log all the oops, the valid oops that were ever created? Oh, yeah. Absolutely, it could. Yeah, I mean, it could be a stale pointer, for example. It could have been a pointer that was valid once, and then the object got deallocated, you would say. Yeah, it was definitely pointing into a valid... Okay. That's the picture No, 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 it was different points every time. No, but for looking where it acts, you know, if your CPU has half of a push point, you can really check when you can read or when it says to the address. But it's a different address every time. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, the, the same fault would happen at a different place every time. The faulting address was a different address every time. Yes. Uh -huh. 48 gigabyte heat, keep going. <laughs> Yeah, how big is your offer? <laughs> okay. Well, okay, this, this was basically doing lots and lots of allocation for hours on end, 48 gigabyte heat, 48 processors running in parallel. Right? Okay, so, one thing that I had noticed <coughs> it seemed to be clear that the pointer, the object that was bad, and also the pointer that was bad, was in what we call the old generation of the heap. Hotspot debugger told me that. I wouldn't have realized otherwise, but Hotspot debugger has a very nice little function called summarize, them, which will tell you what regions are where. And I've run it now maybe six times or something. Um, I had to stop deleting core files because, you know, they were huge. But the inform enough information I've got was that 
it seemed to be that this was always in the old generation. Now, a generational garbage collector works on the hypothesis that almost all objects die young. Um, so you collect the young generation fairly aggressively, but once you've failed to collect an object for some number of iterations, you, you give up, you move it into, shuffle it aside into the old generation, and you leave it there, and you maybe don't even bother collecting the old generation at all, because the chances of anything dying after it's been around for a long time are pretty low. So, this is interesting. It's always in the old generation. So maybe I can write, I can guess, just out of there, that the problem is somewhere in the garbage collector, and it's something to do with old generation collection. Oh yes, and remember, I still don't trust the hardware. So, yeah. Was I looking at a bug in the garbage collector? Look, I've never seen any of that stuff in that spot. I mean, I know it's there, and I know it's, it's kind of a good thing, but I mean, at Sun, Oracle, I've always had a separate team doing garbage collection who are good at that kind of thing. Um, I've never, ever bothered to look underneath the covers in the garbage collector, and it was too late to tell by the time the safe one happened whether the problem was actually the collector itself. Okay, so. I wrote this small problem called GC Stress, and what it does, it creates an array of it's of varying sizes, it tries to churn the collection as much as possible. But what I was also doing was making sure that a very large part of the objects that I was allocating never died. So I'm trying to maximally stress old generation collections. So that every 100,000 allocations, I will decimate the old generation list. I will delete <coughs> all the internal objects. Uh, and then I will call system.dc, which forces a complete collect collection of the old generation and of the young generation. So that means that the old generation collection is being hit harder than it ever will in any reasonably uh, written application. 10 minutes and it crashed in the same Yeah. And, and you've got a much narrower scope. Yeah. Now, this didn't really prove it was to do with an old generation collection, but it's a damn good um, I think I'm, I think I'm just kind of getting close. Okay, so back to the. Uh, Garbage, back to the debugging theme. Come up with a hypothesis. Okay, so I can now run it pretty quickly, again and again, and I can start coming up with a hypothesis about what the cause of the problem is. I mean, remember that I hadn't really started looking at the garbage collector yet, um, so I could run it many times looking for clues. Now, parallel garbage collectors split the heap up into regions and assign a different thread to each region and all the threads work on the heap in parallel uh, and they've got one region each or one region at a time ah and then i noticed something else from looking at that pointer i just noticed hold on there's a lot of zeros in every place and it always seemed to be it wasn't always the same place but the interesting thing was the pointer was often at the start of a region. Now, maybe I should look at the code that's allocating work to the GC's work Because <laughs> if you remember, I was talking about um, relaxed memory consistency earlier. Maybe there's a missing memory barrier somewhere when regions are handed out from one thread to another or handed out from um, the sort of supervisory threat to another. <coughs> so let's have a look at the code which is actually doing the load balancing uh, between the threads. All right, so the parallel GC uses a very clever algorithm called work speed. You'll see this in many, many parallel collectors, probably every parallel collector in the unit, essentially. So each thread has a queue of things that it has to do. Each one is a region to mark or compact. Some regions are put on the queue of the current thread, and then other threads come along and steal. 
Work stealing is a beautiful, beautiful algorithm. It's very, very simple and gives you near perfect load balancing between multiple threads for really almost no cost at all. It is a real piece of genius. If, you, if you're the sort of people who have a favorite algorithm, you should have a look at this one. And, and just to interject, work stealing has applications far beyond collectors. Oh, it's yeah. all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Work stealing is, is awesome. Okay, now work stealing queues are implemented with a lock free algorithm, which is doing kind of compare and swap operations and all the rest of it. So, again, relaxed memory model. When you write into memory, you only write your local cache. To ensure that other threads observe your writes and reads, what it means to observe your read is too complicated to go into. You must use memory value instructions. So, Historically, Hotspot has been mostly run on systems, Spark and x86, that implement the total store order. Now, total store order means that if one core writes into a bunch of memory locations, every core observes that set of writes in the same order. That is not true on AH64. It randomly scrambles them into some order or other. So I had to consider the possibility that the lock 3 implementation of works, works did was actually wrong. Um, so, what do you do? You try and prove that hypothesis wrong. And the trick there is fairly simple. You've basically thrown locks around everything. Um, so it was no longer lock free, it was locked and locked and locked again. Um, this is quite a lot of work because you have to find all of the places where your lock stealing queue is accessed and throw locks around everything. And eventually, after a couple, of, a couple more days, uh, I basically ran out of things to lock. And it still crashed. Uh, so, mm, it's not. Uh, so, at least the book's not in lock free queues, at least not only to do lock free queues. But, important point here for the rest of the work I was doing on it, I left those locks in. I'm not going to take them out. Just carry on and look for something else. Because, you know, if you'd taken the locks out at that point because you were convinced it wasn't the locks that were the problem, then you could have found some other bug and you wouldn't have noticed it because it was still. Leave the locks in there. Oh, God, I'm going to have to understand the garbage collector. Uh, okay, here we go. Four phases of old generation collection are mark live objects, summarize regions, compact regions, and clean up the regions. Right, so, walk over the heap. Summarize the regions means find all the live objects. You calculate where they are going to be moved to. And this is done in parallel by these parallel threads. You then compact them, again, using the parallel threads, and you clean up all the cross-region references. So the eventual destination of each object is decided long before that object is actually copied. This is going to turn out to be crucially important. Um, so every now and then a pointer to an object will point to somewhere in the middle of another object. At this point, all, both objects are always in the old generation. This is interesting. There was nothing else for it. I was going to have to write some tracing code and add it to the GC. Now this is problematic because tracing takes time. The GC is a fantastically tuned, hyper-efficient, uber-maximized piece of software. Adding tracing, even very, very low overhead tracing, is potentially problematic. It's potentially going to make your bug go away or move or something like that. Uh, yeah. Oh, as it says. Okay, so I've done low overhead logging before. I know how to do it. You use nmap to allocate thread local log buffers. You map, you make them huge. You map them with no reserve, and you just write into them. Um, this is nice because you don't need to know in advance uh, how big they're going to have to be. I've got oodles of RAM anyway. Um, yeah. So, two log routines, one for a new pointer, which as you can imagine, tells you where a pointer is going to be after the object's moved, and the other one is move and update closure, which actually does the, does the um, So, I now have a lot of logs. Well, what I have in these logs is a record of where 
every object was supposed to be moved to, and where every object actually was moved to. And then I can write some consistency checks, which try and check that they do the same thing. So there must be an exact equivalence between every point of rewrite and every object. <coughs> Bang. Okay, there we are. We've got a mismatch. We've got a calculated destination for an object, and we've got where the object was actually moved to. And oh boy, they are actually different. It's one in a billion, one in a hundred billion, I don't know. Um, but it's just a one-off. Every now and then, the destination of an address of an object is wrong. So <coughs> let's step through uh, this code to try to understand how it works. Because remember, garbage collector is a big, complicated piece of software. When you actually read an industrial strength garbage collector, it never looks anything like the algorithms in the books. Um, I believe Doug Lee has an entire lecture on that subject, which is why algorithms in real life never look like they're doing the books. Um, so I'm stepping through to understand that. I'm also stepping through callers to try and understand it. I don't know about you, but I use GDB a lot, not necessarily for debugging if I don't understand a piece of software. I'll read it for a while, but I'll only get you just so far. You, eventually, you're just going to stop through. So, I was talking about special case code, corner cases. There is a lot of special case code to handle objects which straddle regions. That is, they straddle the regions which are worked on by different threads. And the way it actually works is that one thread calculate, co copies half of the objects and the other thread copies the other half. This is very, very tricky. Now, I spent ages looking at this, trying to figure out how that code which copies objects, which straddle regions, might actually fail. But I looked at it, and in the end, I had to admit, damn, this is really bad. So, despite the fact that I thought that that was an obvious smoking gun, you know, it always seemed to be object at the start of a region, that was wrong? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I can't know for sure, but I think the code which actually handles um, objects copied between regions is wrong. Okay, so I carried on reading, and then I came across this gem, and I'm going to read it slowly because it's a beautiful piece of writing. <laughs> <laughs> this is in Calc New Pointer, which calculates where an object is going to go when it's copied. Fill in the block table if necessary. This is unsynchronized. <laughs> so multiple threads may fill the block table for a region. Harmless, since it is idempotent. How can you not love idempotency? Um, idempotency, for those of you who haven't been exposed to it in CS lectures, uh, means that an operation can be done several times and the effect will be the same every time. You think about an idempotent interface, it's something like a light switch that you press up to turn on or down to turn off. That is an idempotent interface. Idempotent interfaces are good. The kind of light switch which is bad is when you look at it, you can't tell whether it's turned on or not, and you have to press it, and each time it turns it on or off with the same action. This is a non-idempotent interface. Non-idempotent interfaces are always a bad thing. Anyway, so in theory, both threads could actually calculate this block table, which is the table of uh, regions to be copied. But they both do it at the same time. And then you set a flag here to say that the blocks have been filled. So if the block table is already, if the block table is not filled, then we fill it up. If it is already filled, uh, we just use it. This is pretty cool, right? So, only one, only, most of the time, some other thread has got there before you. So, let's have a look at the set of blocks filled and blocks filled. 
This is the code which sets or tests the flag for whether a block is filled or not. Do you see anything interesting here? Yeah. Do you see anything missing? Memory barriers? Yes. Remember what I was telling you about memory barriers? There aren't any. So the block table is filled by a thread. Then it sets blocks filled. So what can happen? I'll go back to the <coughs> caller. What can happen here is that some thread will be coming along. It will hit that point and say, aha, the block table is full. And it will then carry on in the rest of the code using the block table that some other thread. But remember that writes to memory are not ordered, right? <coughs> so this thread which has come along, it says, OK, I can use that block table, sees a partially populated block table. And that block table is telling you where the object is going to go. So there is a brief window when threads are racing where you see that flag is set. You read the data, the data is wrong, or the data is stale. And that was the fix. <laughs> One barrier there in blocks filled to make sure that you've got an acquire barrier to make sure that the data is up to date. And another one in set box. Now, Mark, how long has the power of that been around? Yeah. It worked on most answers. Well, I was thinking that the newer power PCs had a similar memory. Oh, it worked on most answers. systems. I mean, you're looking at a very small window, and we only saw it on a machine with 48 cores, right? Because that, that race doesn't happen very often, because the updating of that table is it's pretty unusual for, oh, yeah. for two threads to be racing at that point. This, this is production quality code that's been in every Java system for however many decades, right? At least one decade, I guess. Okay, so, yeehaw. Time to break out the champagne, maybe. Oh, except for testing. But, yeah, I'll cut to the chase. That was it. That was all it was in the end. Um, so, I've gone through potentially a million lines of code, tracking it down, and found the two lines that nobody had ever noticed before. Um, just to finish up, we don't talk about debugging enough. We certainly don't talk about debugging much here. It's interesting to think about why. Uh, I guess the trouble with debugging is that you have to admit <coughs> that, you know, programming fails. Programmers fail. We all fail. There's no shame. And it's very hard to understand these uh, systems with very uh, relaxed memory consistency. Um, I would like to think that in some small way I'm going to start a trend here at Cosden uh, where people do talk about this kind of thing. And maybe something like this, this kind of detective story, this real world debugging adventure, uh, can be interesting in its own way. I hope you found it so. Thank you.